This is the 8-9 Combo. I am Brett McKay and I'm joined by my mysteriously disfigured co-host, Harry Jones. Hello, mate. What's going on here? How's for it, our, man? For our uh, podcast listeners who, who aren't, don't have the, the, uh, the, the benefit of YouTube and pictures right now, uh, Harry has a very nice line of stitches down the length of his nose, um, which I'm going to assume was some sort of breakdancing incident over the weekend. Well, I was in a Queensland strip club this weekend, and I cut in front of Tate McDermott, um, <laughs> and the bugger had been practicing his aim at the punching mitigation school, and he just caught yeah. me. Oh, yeah, that's right. my first story. That's my first story. Actually, it was, uh, it was Colonel Bastard with a lead pipe in a conservatory. Um, <laughs> no, actually, it was, I, played, I played rugby league for one minute. This is what happens to you, kids. So don't right? go to league. Australian kids, go to union. Is it... Nah, uh... It's basically, you know, I'm a fixer, as you know, and I do a lot of things here and there. But to fix things, sometimes uh, stuff's got to be broken. And as our friends on Stan Sports love to do with their puns about fluke and peach and gamble and heaven, you know, I wouldn't want to take anything I say here at face value. You know, I expected your nosy questions. And I came up with some answers to put you uh, in stitches. But uh, I don't want (laughs) to blow it or be too stuffy. So the truth is... I'm not actually allowed to talk about what happened to my nose, but don't worry, everyone. It'll be fine. I can stop wipe, I, I wiping have, it. I only have one question for you. If this is plastic surgery gone wrong, <laughs> will the end result be straighter than that line of stitches? <laughs> As anyone who knows me at all knows, I would never do any kind of plastic surgery. Um, it's, I'm too far gone for that. <laughs> but, but no, it's, oh, it's, just, it's just a simple misunderstanding, you know, blunt force trauma meets nose. Uh, but I did, I, I did win in the end, just so everyone knows. Okay, okay. Yeah. good to know, good to know. Uh, it, it's the 10th it's the weekly episode of the 8-9 Combo Rugby Podcast, <laughs> all thanks to the Sports Social Network, uh, the Sports Social Podcast Network, that is. And you might know us from the Raw Rugby Podcast in recent years, but we have made a new home under our new 8-9 banner on all the platforms and that's Amazon and Audible and Spotify and Apple and YouTube and all its musical offspring, uh, iHeart and whatever is left of Google Podcasts, which I'm told might have already disappeared in the US as of a few weeks ago, but literally wherever you get your podcasts, so please do like, follow, subscribe, uh, rate and review and share us as well. And mate, we're thrilled that people have followed us over from our previous home, but for those listeners who have only just discovered one of the great global rugby podcast duos in 2024 what is the eight nine combo all about what's it all mean who's the eight who's the nine although i think the line on your nose explains (laughs) i spent all my rugby career looking just like this except with blacker (laughs) eyes um no so we are obviously the eight nine combo i am the eight and and brett is the nine Uh, i would say this there's a lot of combinations on the rugby pitch and we're going to hear more about that today in our discussion and some of the combinations are so obvious, they just fit together like hand and glove, like the 9-10. But the 8-9 is that curious combination on the rugby pitch that is like polar opposites. So someone came up with this. It's like the detailist is the 9 and the half arsicist is me, the 8. <laughs> and that's the source like of the that. friction. But when it does work, and you can it's think beautiful. right now of this weekend of people that played 8-9 and those teams hummed. Mm, it's true. It's a good one. I like that. That's a good explanation. That might be your best yet. Uh, cheers and jeers is the new name for the same way we've started the pod for a good while. And I will start with a cheers, mate, to the Melbourne Rebels, who with mm. their very excellent and well-worked win over the Highlanders on Saturday night find themselves in the Super Rugby Pacific top four going into round nine. Now, it's I posed the question over the weekend on the socials, whether it's the first time that's actually happened. It's not... It's not the first time they've been in the top four. In fact, they've led the competition in rounds one or round two of the season. But it's the first time since they joined the comp in 2011 that they've worked themselves into the top four by this midpoint of the year. And that's to be applauded because they are going very, very well at the moment. Very so nice. What three quick you? three quick years. Bongi, who's yeah. shown in, in Bongi Banambi, was shown in the Chasing the Sun, excellent series, episode four, weeping at the end and consoled by Jacques Ninaber in a touching scene. But this weekend, he decided to dive to score an open try, no one touching him, and injured himself on said dive, which I think is just <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> uh, the next that one reminds, is going to be the first. reminds me of a, a mate of mine who did his ACL <laughs> dive and scored, scored a try playing touch footy. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, French fans in Bordeaux who just seemed so ready to be outraged in the excellent match between them and the Harlequins. Mm. They were just unspeakably, ignorantly, erroneously outraged before anything had been explained and just on the most basic misunderstanding of facts. And then finally, uh, as as our beautiful and uh, musical partner, Jeff Parks, our friend Jeff Parks, put uh, put it this, the Crusaders game management when you have a kick and the referee says they can ice, they can finish well, the game oh, by just yeah. standing there and then you do it with nine seconds to go, allowing the fabulous comeback win by the Waratahs. Yeah, yes, it was indeed. It was indeed. That was, that was a moment of madness, wasn't it? But there'll be no <laughs> madness from this week's guest who is new not just to the 8-9 combo, but new to Brett and Harry as well. But you have certainly heard us speaking about his specialty subject. He is coming up right after this. And now I'll add him to the stage, and there he is. This has all gone seamlessly. Uh, it's the first time we've spoken to this week's guest, but certainly not the first time we've spoken to Game Line Analytics, recalling the great rugby chat we had last season with Ben Darwin. This week, it's the co founder and the general manager of sport, and the man Ben insists is the true brains behind the operation. Please welcome to the 8 9 combo, Simon Strawn. Hello, mate. Welcome. How are you doing? Uh, very good. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Brett and Harry. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, now, I mean, you can take full credit for being the brains of the operation. That was what <laughs> wanted to insist on. Is that? Do you need to rebuff that, or, or are you no? Ben, like that? Uh, ben does underplay his hand. He he is the heart and soul of Gainline Analytics, but uh, we do have very different roles in the business where. Is definitely the man who really understands the concepts of cohesion. Where my role is actually turned it into something that resembles a business, uh, working with <laughs> yeah. uh, working with organisations and and actually turning it into something that we can use in an ongoing basis. Ben <laughs> has this amazing capacity to see patterns, but then he wants a billion dollar company and own to own sports sporting teams. And my job is to fill that gap in between. Uh, and so, this is. This is an elaborate sledge, Simon. It's like you're, no, no, no. you're confirming it's, that you are the brains is, and he's the madcap guy. No, no, no. Well, he is. <laughs> Look, and he will uh, he will fully admit that. But that is why we work. That's why we work together so well as a team. Yeah. You know, that's where and I dare I use the term. That's where the cohesion comes in. That we work very well uh, very as a combination because sort of our skills um, where he lacks, I add, and where I lack, he adds. So it works very well together. No, we're looking forward to this. I know Harry's very much looking forward to delving deep into the deep thinking behind rugby at the moment. And I don't know, by the end, maybe you'll have spent enough time with us that you can finally tell us how much cohesion we have as a combination or don't have as a combination. Maybe that might be the concerning bit, Harry. I don't know. Yeah, you know, fix know us. That? Fix us <laughs> um, while you're here. <laughs> yeah. Well, well as, as a good point to start, Simon, I sort of figure is, um, is around the – the capacity that you're seeing in teams these days. And and the, I guess the starting point there is that um, we know that you guys had identified that the Crusaders going into 2024, having lost, you know, uh, Moana, White Lock, Taylor, and however many else, however many other All Blacks that they did lose, that they would, that they would you know, really struggle in, in, in 2024 and that the... And that the machine was churning through talent like it always does, but the talent that was coming through was going to be a long way short in terms of combination and cohesion and all that for what we're used to from the Crusaders of, of, of recent years. Talk, talk to us about that, what you saw um, and, and what you're seeing in teams, I suppose, in 2024. Yeah, so there was a premonition to where we see the Crusaders now. And, and if people take their mind back to Super Rugby Trans Tasman uh, back in 2021, which was a, tumult a tumultuous time in Super mm -hmm. Rugby because during COVID, we split up into Super Rugby Aotearoa, Super Rugby AU. Mm -hmm. uh, the Crusaders won Super Rugby Aotearoa, mm -hmm. had really good defensive record, had really good cohesion markers, as we described, the way we measure cohesion. Then through circumstance, um, the, the Crusaders actually had the worst offensive record out of all the um, New Zealand Super Rugby teams in, in Super Rugby Trans-Tasman. And that was a combination of uh, injury, uh, selection and all black resting. And it just, yes. what it meant was their markers were poor. 
And when you have poor markers in certain areas and their defensive markers were poor and they let in a high amount of points. And so regardless of, and the way we describe it, the aura of a team, when the markers are, the, when the markers, the numbers of the numbers, it's generally reflected in performance in that way. So, and that particular season, the, the Blues ha actually had the best um, set of markers, the best defensive markers, mm. they had the best defensive record, they end up winning Trans-Tasman. So that was almost a little signal, a, a micro example of, of the macro that's happened for them through, and you could you could look at the New Zealand system, the dynamics of New Zealand rugby is changing a little bit. Moanga, you could argue from New Zealand standards have left early uh, compared to what other tens have left. Their, their second choice, number 10, is injured. They're down to their third choice. He was injured yeah. for a little bit as well. Then they've got their guys, where are they coming through the system? <clears throat> Previously, during the Robbie Deans era, literally a third of their cohesion, a third of their understanding was coming through Canterbury. And so when you debuted for the Crusaders, you were literally playing with those most of those guys anyway. Yeah. So you never yeah. truly debuted. When you are playing with people already, you're already removing a lot of the ambiguity. It's like playing for Ireland, you, you come through, you're literally playing with, you know, 12 other Leinster, Leinster you've, men. You've already played 50 games for Leinster, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or exactly even right. back and to then, St. Michael's, Black Rock, you know, they yeah. actually have the same cluster of schools even in Leinster. Well, there was a game, there was an Osprey, there was a Leinster Ospreys game last month and the starting 15 for Leinster was 12 St. Michael's and three Black Rock. <laughs> And that's yeah, right. there you go. And so it's about the part. Yeah, so pathway is a good example. So what's happened with the Crusaders now is that just through circumstance, through the changing dynamic in in New Zealand rugby, that they just so happen to have a squad plus injury plus leaving early plus a change of coach because of course Razors left after yes. twenty four years in the Canterbury in the Crusaders system. system. Mm. He's taken a lot of IP, but he's also taken the top sort of the, the top layer of coach. So they've got new coaches coming through. There's going to be a bit of a change of program. So yeah. there's these layers and layers and layers of uh, that have changed um, within the organisation. So they're going through a shift. But but every confidence, they understand what drives performance, what drives cohesion in that organisation. And I think they're basically going to work through, not make any drastic decisions uh, and come mm. through the end. I, you know, I feel for um, poor... Um, Rob Penny, because yeah. he sort of came in into this situation very similar to what he came in at the Waratahs. Waratahs had gone through a generational shift after winning the title. He came through at a low point, and that sort of reflected on, unfortunately, reflected yeah. on him. And and he's he's sort of in that similar position. But as an organisation, I think they know where they're at, and they're going to work through it. And, and they've so the you, you've had conversations with them, so they are fully yeah. across this. They know. Yeah. yeah, we're in a hole at the moment, but in time, the numbers will be the numbers and we'll be yeah. fine, like, like the Crusaders always are. Yeah. Well, that's, well that's, that's, that's expectations for the board as yeah. well. So then you give a guy like Rob Penny time, correct? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's why we as an organisation, so Gainline Analytics, we describe ourselves as a governance-focused, um, data-driven organisation. We our role is to go into the top of organization and drive down. And the most important part is that governance, is that board level understanding performance, because that's ultimately where the long-term decisions are made. That's what drives, yeah. That's ultimately that's what drives cohesion. So, so just from a cohesion standpoint, when we talk about cohesion, we talk about what's called TWI or teamwork index. Yep. That teamwork is index. What, yep. how we measure how a squad is put together. And, and TWI, or the, that measure, is developed over multi-years of decision-making. And so what the governance board does at that level ultimately drives TWI. And then TWI is effectively a measure of the capacity of a team to drive in-game cohesion. So the higher your TWI, the higher capacity you have. So last year, for example, in URC Top 14 Super Rugby and Premiership uh, was won by... Uh, the number one TWI in three of the comps and the number two TWI in the other comp. And right. so it's a really good predictor of who's going to basically, uh, who's going to be performing at the top. And so that TWI is really, it, it's multi years. And so what's happening in a game, when we see, say if you see a line break, say if you see that a, a, a team's been broken in the line or the line bent. So somebody in the stand might look at that and say, 
you know, that's a poor tackle or a poor read by a player. What we do, instead of looking at the skill activity, we would look at and say, what's the cohesion relationship in that defensive line? Okay, well, we, we, we know what that is because we've got a massive database of yeah. every game of professional rugby union, what players have played for who teams in what positions with who, and so we can measure these things. And so, okay, if that cohesion relationship, what decisions were, in, were made in the organisation to create that and when were they made? Was it a selection decision made yesterday or was it the fact that those two players are playing because of a recruitment decision made three years ago because the board hypothetically wanted to win the competition tomorrow yeah and so that's so that's basically when we look at this that's sort of what we're trying to instill in an organization the decision you make four years ago is still impacting what's happening now so um and and, and that's where it's important why there's why for example like the crusaders that understand this is around that they've still got the long burn to to, to work through the situation they're currently in yeah, so if right. I was working, if I was a, an apprentice working at the uh, rugby laboratory of Gainline Analytics <laughs> and I was on the salt mines, you know, Ben Darwin's just shouting, give me some numbers on Leicester Tigers, KPI, WPI, I, and I was doing a bad job, I would just say to you guys, you can't, no, don't fire me because I'm building cohesion, a level of understanding <laughs> with you. It takes seven years. I would work forever at your place. Is, yeah. that, how, is that how it works at your, at your rugby lab? That's absolutely how it works. So now, so... <laughs> We as a business, so we as a business, we have um, we have uh, a we have researchers, so yeah. researchers, and we have them actually around the world. So our, the first ever research we hired a guy named Fabian, who's in Romania. He is awesome. Ben fired him four times. <laughs> but now I literally he's worked with us. He's worked with us for ten years. I write a literally a three word email. And Fabian, he just gives me the information I need because he knows exactly what I want. Yeah, right. And how, like, and you know, for a Romanian, he knows so much about state of origin. He knows <coughs> so much about, you know, the impact of the stormers have on the spring box. Yeah, right. That's cool. If- yeah, we do the same things, uh, Simon. I work at board level as well. That's why I have a 15, nine stitches on my nose right now. But, um, uh, it's always it's always dealing with you know if things aren't right things aren't going sure. right. I'm not so, sure that's the title story, but carry on. <laughs> like, do you get a lot of that sort of rescue jobs? Do you have boards reach out and say fix us? You know, we find ourselves in a trough like yeah. those Crusaders, and maybe they haven't seen it correctly. Uh, is it, is it, is, get- yeah, and, and and my question there yeah. is where where are the pressure points to grow first? For example. If you find yourself in a trough like Crusaders, either because of injury, people left, or a coach just you know leaves, um, is it? Do you have you found which combinations and areas on the field it's most important to build cohesion, and you can survive some untested wings, for example, or yeah. you know that that kind of thing? I think to answer your first <clears throat> question, um, um, the, the type of teams we we generally work for, there's generally two types. There is the team that has their absolutely has their act together, and all they're looking for is signals of failure. We know mm. where we're at, oh. and so what we well, want. I thought to you were going is, to say they're looking for confirmation. That's interesting. Well, well, it's it's more about <laughs> like I'll give you a good example. So every 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 now and again, I catch up with um, Frank Panisi at the Melbourne Storm, and yep. the, the Melbourne Storm over the years have really they know how to do things and and if they fall in a bit of a trough which arguably by melbourne storm standards they're in a little bit of a trough but they can always look back to what they when they were at the the top of their game because they were at the top of the game they can understand what it's what what it looks like what the way they look at things is very similar to the way we look at things they just use different a, a different lens through it but it's often a case of comparing notes. We don't have to tell them how to win or do things, but it's often a good a mirror in that way. Yeah, right. Um, and, and so, and Frank um, is like, you know, people talk about Craig Bellamy in the Melbourne Storm, but it's the Craig Bellamy and Frank Panisi show. It's Absolutely. the GM right. Andy, Andy sitting Club underneath it. But, um, but then, so you have these, these clubs that are actually the top of the game and they wanted to have this understanding about, you know, what potentially are the signals of failure because they could, a club could still do everything right, but everyone can do everything better and it might look like they're going backwards. Right, and, right. And, yeah. 
Amazing. And they're trying to build a dynasty or keep going. Yeah. 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 And then you get the clubs right at the bottom. Oh my God, what's, you know, we're at, at last resort. I've heard of this company somewhere in, tucked away in Melbourne. Maybe they can help us. Can you help um, us? Yeah. But then the issue with that, sometimes the issue with that is they're going over to throw much churn, so much chaos. Often you can't necessarily make change. You know, let's bring yeah. in a new, let's bring in a new coach. And the coach is, man, he did a good interview and he's going to do X, Y, Z. Yeah, strangely enough, that's what the last coach said, and we haven't actually made much progress. Um, yeah. But for us, you know, as a business, the volume's actually in the middle, but then th that middle group is the middle group that's constantly saying, we just need those two or three extra better players and we're going to be yeah. right. And that's often actually the problem why they sit in the middle um, in that way. So, so do you mean, uh, do you mean that yeah. if they just stayed with what they have, even if it's not superlative talent, that three or four seasons in – you know, you have t you have players who people thought was funny, like uh, Jesse Creel is terrible. Everyone in South Africa says Jesse Creel is terrible. And then, you know, you look back and he's played in three World Cups and he's always performed at the highest level. And you come you come back to the idea, but he just knew where Damon Dialende was or he knew what Willie LaRue, where, where he wanted him to be. And so even if he's not the best, most talented guy, he, you know, he has that level of understanding you're talking about. Yeah, so in no way... in through our lens, do we say if you get 15 Muppets and throw, you know, play them for four years, they'll win the World Cup. So it's always skill times cohesion equals capacity. At the pointy end right. of professional sport, the differential of skill is not huge. Yeah. However, yeah. the differential of cohesion is quite big. The teams yeah. at the top of the URC compared to the bottom of the URC, teams at the top of Super Rugby, the bottom of Super Rugby, the difference of cohesion is quite big. Yeah. The difference of talent is not actually that big. <clears throat> Where it's slightly different, though, say top top fourteen, the difference between the, the say the some of the top clubs at f whatever fourteen million euro compared to Iona at the bottom at at six to seven million euro, that's a massive disparity in talent. So right. Iona has done a great job. Um, in being promoted, like killing it in Pro D2 with still not the top salary and have less than half of some of those top clubs, but ringing the absolute, um, um, the best out of their squad by um, getting the most out of that group in that way. So every different comp has a different dynamic to yeah, it, right. understanding what levers you have um, in the particular comp. Like the Irish teams in the URC, for example, they've got, They've got, you know, they've got the best lever of probably any any club around because they've got tax breaks in Ireland. Play Irish players don't need to leave Ireland because they they get tax uh, breaks. Yes, and so yes, it encourages to stay. them to yeah. stay. And then you get Leinster. They've got this beautiful little lever that sits below them. About they've got these controlled pathways that sit below. So, but then you've got. Um, um, the Crusaders, in a completely different scenario, and I use the Crusaders even though they're not going well, but obviously we know that they are a juggernaut of the system, mm. has a completely different system but uses their levers yeah. uh, to be able to produce um, cohesion, produce performance. So you mentioned there before that, um, that that three of the four winners last year were the had the highest teamwork index in the competition. Yeah. I, I won't be so bold to tell you, to ask who's leading currently, but what I what I will ask is to try and get a bit of context around that. So, what what is like what what is an average TWI number, I suppose, and and you know what where do the top teams sort of sit in comparison to that? Yeah. So and again, it's and now it's different. So and this is where so the 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 highest TWI in Super the TWI in Super Rugby is different to the TWI in the Premiership. Right. And it's different to the URC, is different to um, top 14. And the reason that is, TWI is, is basically a measure of recruitment philosophy, yep. recruitment methodology. Part of that is the structure in that particular um, competition. So, for example... So, in number New of Zealand, games, all that sort of thing as well. Well, number of games, but also the pathway. So, in New yeah, Zealand, sure. where they have a very functional Tier 3 through NPC... <laughs> yep. So yep. they have an obvious and clear pathway of where they bring their players through. Yep. And that helps them identify and capture and keep talent. Say so in the premiership in England, they don't have that. And so they have a yes. different way of developing their squads in that way. Likewise, Which is their academy system, isn't it? With academy as opposed to a 
tier competition sitting below. Yeah. France yeah. is different. They have, you know, obviously they have a, a second tier comp, but those are separate standalone independent yes. teams. So they don't have pathways. What they have in France, though, is their espoirs, their under 20s. And Toulouse have been one of the best in being able to use right. their espoirs to bring their players through uh, in that way. So again, it's about how they use your, how what levers do you have and how well do you use them? Do you go to market like the old Toulon of the Wilkinson? Gitto back in the day because mm. you've got deep pockets, that sort of thing, or do you go internally like Toulouse have done? So, because of course, with yeah. Toulon, when the money runs out, the talent runs out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get into cultural cohesion as well? I mean, it may be hard to research that, but yeah, really, it's a really good question. So, when we talk about cohesion, it is an objective level of understanding between players, it is not social cohesion. That is not our remit. So in the crudest way, we don't care if people like each other or not. And from Ben's own playing experience, he's played with teams where players have loved each other, but they were completely yeah. dysfunctional on the pitch. <laughs> I teams think where players hated I, each other and they were absolutely functional on the pitch. I think, that's he, true. Even, I think right. he even said to us last year, Simon, was that the best coach he had was the one he couldn't stand the most. Yeah. But in saying that, in no way, in no way – we're advocating obviously you want every you know you want everyone on the same page of course however however you know we call it not we don't use the word culture because it sort of means a lot nothing at the same time so we use the term normative behaviors so normative behaviors on the pitch normative behaviors off the pitch so we've we've seen lots of examples of high normative behaviors within an organization that grows out of how they were put together. Um, and so you get high levels of psychological safety in a high cohesion, high TWI environment. And that's the environment you need. So you have people in the change room questioning each other in a very um, um, uh, structured way. Why weren't you in that position? And you know, not taking umbrage from it. So um, you wanna be able to have, as an individual, you wanna be able to function to the highest capacity, but from a team perspective, through some of our research as well, we, we haven't necessarily seen that it, the cultural side necessarily has a massive influence on performance. Yeah, I was, I was reading your white papers over the weekend uh, as I was uh, as my nose was throbbing and I wanted to distract myself. And I started to wonder on the Springboks whether they were outlier or actually the, the proof of concept of your concept. Because I looked at it, you look at the Springboks, they are actually far afield, Tokyo, France, all over the place, England, Ireland, <clears throat> and then they come together in these, you know, uh, World Cup years. And and so you could say, well, where's the cohesion? But then again, you look at most of them are from the Western Cape. Fulgaru, Western Cape boy. Andre mm-hmm. Pollard, Western Cape. Uh, Justin Colby, Cape Town. Uh, Etzebeth, Cape Town. So wherever they are playing now, there is this common, uh, maybe it's not a cultural cohesion so much as a they understand the same things in the same moment because they played same schools in front of 5,000 people, Varsity Cup in front of 20,000 people, Curry Cup, you know, all these levels. You can go back and see France, Malabra, Stevie Kitsoff and Bongi and Banambi playing when they were 17 years old together or against each other. Yeah. Right. So basically to win the World Cup, so over the history of the um, professional World Cup, say from 99 onwards, when you look at the markers, when you look at our markers, which are an objective level of objective level of a team, we measure every team exactly the same way. All World Cup winning teams sit in the same zone. So you basically, and effectively, the highest cohesion team generally wins the Rugby World Cup. So in 2019 and 2023, last year, the Springboks were absolutely in the competitive zone to win the Rugby World Cup. In fact, the Springboks were one of the highest. So mm-hmm. not no surprise, <clears throat> Springboks, New Zealand, Ireland were the three highest last year. And so the numbers are basically, in the crudest sense, a measure of the amount of basically games played relationships with all those players. So even though they, yes, they are spread to the four winds around the earth, they have played to the same amount that all those other teams Ireland have played, New Zealand have played. And so even though there's a perception that they play everywhere, they've still played a significant amount of time together to develop yeah. a high level of understanding. 
with it. So, and um, this is material for the Wallabies, right? So as Joe Schmidt it comes back in and sort of grapples with this idea of how loose the Gitto rule should be, uh, there is an argument to say that there's plenty of talent abroad that would help the squad, and there is cohesion there. Uh, and we shouldn't say, well, we don't know how you know how how well Skelton plays or Angus Scott Young because there might be enough cohesion at Waratah level or or so forth. Uh, yes and no. Uh, weirdly enough, obviously I talk about the Springboks were a extremely high cohesive team, but personally I'm not a fan of overseas based players. Mm. And, and one of the reasons being that the, the that Springboks team that went through 19 into 23, which was there was this tight core group of players that played from 19 into 23, even though they, they played from Rassi 15 actually. Blooded, yeah. Yeah. Rassi blooded a whole bunch of people in the last mm. four years, but none of those, when it came to push came to show, if those guys didn't play. But those were the guys. So when Rassi took over 18 months out from 2019, the trajectory, he basically picked his group and he picked and stuck. And that was essentially the group that came through and was still, a majority of them were still playing. And yes, once you've got a stable group, you can start bringing other people in. In that right. way, yes. so yeah. so what it means is that when those people were coming back, they were coming back to what they know, and it was a it's a really that was a really tight group. The issue is, can that model be replicated by other other countries? It's going to have to be a pretty unique scenario to be able to do that. So it could happen in the Wallabies if you had this example of, you know, 2015, 2019, 2023, playmakers were in place, a core, like the box had, you know, Peter Seftatoy, Etzebeth, Malherba, Pollard, Delende, Creel, LaRue. That's all from 2015. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. There's been so much chop and change at Wallabies. Maybe the, maybe the way is to go really uh, stop changing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's a good start. But, but it's... it's <laughs> The issue yeah. now, of course, the issue now, of course, is you don't know where to start. Yeah, right. That's the issue, of yeah. course, yeah. Um, Joe Schmidt has is where do I start? Um, and then once I've started, I'm having the confidence to continue. What areas of the field does the cohesion matter the most? You know, do you just have uh, to have a four or five? You have to have a nine ten. What does it look like? Yeah, and again, because we, we're lucky enough to work across a whole bunch of different competitions, whether it's MLR, Premiership, um, Top 14, uh, Pro de Deux, um, uh, URC, that different competitions, the dynamic's slightly different in the way. And what it means yeah. is you can actually understand how the different combinations play out and the importance of it. Um, but the, but having that attack spine is, is a really important part. Because you can have cohesion up the wazoo in, say, in the forwards, but if you've got no attack, then there's no point to it. Or you can have cohesion up the wazoo in the backs, but if you've got no platform to attack with through the forwards, then you can't actually use it um, in that way. So um, basically mid midfield, for example, is being able to, from set piece, being able to either um, stop set piece attack so your line isn't broken or bent, then it's so much easier for your defensive line to remain set. If your line gets broken or bent, you are backpedaling. So mm. in the MLR, for example, because it's a relatively low cohesion comp, because there's a high amount of change, it's still building Every as year. a competition. Yeah, 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 yeah. If your line gets broken or bent, you are constantly, you know, from a cohesion standpoint, defense is low, uh, is relatively poor. When I say poor, it's not a player poor. It is a cohesion poor. Just want to stress that. If your line is bent or broken, you're always constantly backpedaling, and it makes it so much harder. So, so, the, so if you can if you can stop that initial set piece in defence, it makes it so much easier um, from that perspective. So, but then it comes to it comes back to at the pointy end, it the differences are minute. Um, yeah, it's interesting at the MLR one, which I watch quite a bit because I'm involved in it now. There's so much space on the field when there's any kind of break. Whereas if you try to finish a break against the Brumbies, you know your your problems have just begun when you get beyond the first line. There's just so many layers of defense. Uh, same thing with um, the Hurricanes; just really good track back defenders. It does seem to me that that does come with you know knowing where your mate's going to be. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, 
yeah, not you know, not chase, not not everyone go into the same place. Everyone actually trusting their mates. But uh, I also wondered about yeah. on whether defense is the thing that suffers the most when you have a lack of cohesion. Or oh, is absolutely. It attack? Or is it attack? Yeah. So it is. So cohesion manifests itself strongly in defense. Mm. So, um, so the way we the way I describe it is, it's not your ability to make a tackle; it's your ability to work with the person next to you in the defensive line. What's their yeah. line speed? What's the spacing? When someone when someone basically comes up to the line and then the, what are they going to do and what are they going to react when they get it wrong? Yeah, your so, dancing partner, your partner yeah, in dance. Yeah, yeah. 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 so yeah. basically you learn cohesion. All of our measurements come from, all our markers come from games and that's basically the ultimate decision-making decision making exercise because you are under maximum pressure. When you're under maximum pressure, what are you going to do? That's when the person next to you learns what you're going to do. And if you do something slightly wrong, the person next to you is going to learn what you do in that situation. So you can imagine in a game of rugby union, 10,000 plus individual activities. And that's, you know, taking the ball into contact, knowing so the person who's coming in to clean out the threat, knowing how you turn and place. If you yeah. just get that split second quicker, that over 10,000 activities, thousands of thousands of activities over a game, is just going to make your ability to execute so much better. So when in defence, when in defence, if you just don't necessarily trust the person inside you, then it just makes it harder. So in the in the workshops we do when we work with clients or do other workshops, I've got this great example of 2011 Wallabies versus the All Blacks. James O'Connor, first ever game on the wing, his first ever game on the wing, at number eleven, I must say, but he was playing for the Wallabies outside Adam Ashley Cooper. A simple, it was it was literally a two on two. All Blacks, but James O'Connor didn't trust Adam Ashley Cooper to change, take the All Black play, and so he bit in, and Ben Smith mm -hmm. just scores out wide. Any under 12, under 10 rugby coach can pinpoint what James O'Connor did wrong, but it was a simple trust thing because it because basically... Because they had literally players, never played together. They'd never played in a game together, and so it was just a case of you get, to, you get two or three more games on the belt, and then... James O'Connor is going to know that Ash Adam Ashley Cooper can make that tackle because Adam Ashley Cooper made the tackle, but James O'Connor mm. just didn't know he was going to make the tackle. Yeah, it's such a good point. When you watch the Irish yeah. team play right now, when someone misses a tackle, you see the Irish players not running to the guy with a ball, but running to where he's going yeah. to be. They, they, they tear off to that spot. You know, you look at mm. James Lowe, who's improved his defense, um, Robbie Henshaw. They, don't, they know where the thing's going to go next. Uh, it's fascinating and to we, watch. And we, One talked, thing that we, talk, we talked just last week with Laurie Fisher about the Brumbies missing tackles in the front line, but their scramble defense is excellent this year. And that's a big change on last year. Their yeah. scramble yeah. is now better this year than it was last year. One, one thing that um, Michael Checker did talk, tried to talk about was, because obviously we talk of cohesion, you, you can't make someone trust. Okay, all right, you're going to trust that person, ready, now trust them. Like that just doesn't happen. You've got to earn trust. But one thing, one thing check knew was that he just didn't have enough time and so what he was trying to stress to the players is give the trust you've just gotta you've just gotta commit that you're going to trust the person and so that example that adam ashley cooper james o'connor example mm. is that under that under what check was trying to say there is that james o'connor's just is going to have to you know work work every sort of emotion <laughs> in his body to say no i'm not going to bite because i've got to absolutely trust so, and that's what, once you have that high levels of cohesion because you've been doing it enough times, then you earn the trust. Now, the other thing is if you've been in the system, if you're a kid, you've never played, but you've had plenty of time in the system, you learn that trust as you go as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the advantage of a good structure with players coming through when you do have a structure um, like, it, say, New Zealand or the Irish system or the South African system coming through, Vodacom Cup, Curry Cup, in the, the old Super Rugby URC, that that players learn the system as they come through, as well. That's so the other thing is, the other thing we talk about defence is um, with cohesion. Like you can get cohesion happening in smaller groups. They say tight five or set piece. Like that can get functioning quite quick. So we know startup franchises, um, whether it be the Rebels or the Force back in the day or the Drua or Mono or Pacifica, they can get their set piece working reasonably quickly. But they, you know, startup franchises still ship, you know, thirty-five plus points in a game because they still have to defend in that line collectively. Yeah. In that way. That's that's a great point for a break.
right there. That's really interesting. Really interesting. This this in depth stuff just fascinates us. It really. It really so, does. Simon, we had to put a lot of trust in uh, Michael Checker when he was going to come on our pod, and he said yes to me on a text, and then I don't know for three we weeks. For three weeks, never, <laughs> and we were getting ready for the pod. We we're just waiting for him to come on. Michael, are you coming? And there, there he was. And there he was on time, as expected. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Simon, how widely accepted now is cohesion as a building block or as a rebuilding block? Um, and I don't even necessarily mean in rugby because I, you've used the example of the Melbourne Storm and I know that you guys work in any number of sports now. So in terms of professional sport, how accepted is it now? Uh, I, so our experience is that the concept of cohesion is accepted. What the the roadblock is is how to achieve it right um because some people uh because i talked about levers before some people don't necessarily know what their levers are sometimes yep. the levers are too difficult um and sometimes it's a case of not necessarily having the capacity to make the decisions or the time frame to make the decisions i yep. under I understand what you're saying, Simon, but uh, I need to win tomorrow and this is not <laughs> helping me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so as a general philosophy, cohesion, a high, more understanding is going to get you better performance is pretty well understood. What the tricky thing is, how do we implement it? Hmm. And that's the thing. So, and like I've touched on, different teams do it in different ways and it's understanding the mechanism so whenever we try and work with organizations with with teams is firstly f to understand the mechanism and then how does that then that mechanism apply within your situation and so how can then you use it so is it adding another team playing more games or reducing your squad or many other sort of different things that can work in with what you have Mm, which teams I've, have the luxury, the luxury of time? Yeah, I think well, I think what Eddie, what Eddie what Eddie Jones should have done for the World Cup when he hired three psychiatrists was make sure that those three psychiatrists had worked a long time together and had cohesion, <laughs> or just worked some time together. <laughs> might have held. Well, let's so let's touch on then from a, from a Wallabies lens. Simon is is Joe Schmidt. Is he better to start looking at combinations, or does he need to go behind that? Can he just pick up the Reds back row and drop it in? Can he just pick up the Brumbies halves and drop them in? Or does he need to look a bit beyond that? Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a case study to tell you there's not one, there's not an easy answer to this. Um, so last right. year's bled, last year's bled is low. So in Melbourne, yeah. the All Blacks send a, from a cohesion perspective, a really good team down in Melbourne. The score was 30 odd to seven. So a comprehensive victory against a, from a cohesion perspective, relatively weak Wallabies. A week later, they go to Dunedin, and the Wallabies have a relatively good performance. Um, and um, the score was 23 21, 23, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Wallaby just led with 10 to go or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, what basically what the All Blacks had done was effectively what we would describe as picked an AB team. So, they had half the team was basically the Chiefs, half of the team were the Crusaders. So, in those two separate bubbles, there was a high amount of understanding in one half, highest amount of yeah. understanding in the other. But when you put them together, not between them. Yeah. you're not between them. And so you create this ambiguity. You create this ambiguity between the two groups. So poor Sean Stevenson got sort of two tries scored around his wing because he was working in this, basically in this whole, the ambiguity of not defending with these other people all the time. Mm. So, so the reason I'm giving you this example is by say, let's pick a, you know, Reds back row with a with a Brumbies tight five with a whatever um, Rebels halves just hypothetically, like all those individual units. Yes, but when you put them together, you create this other dynamic, and so that's where there's any combination you choose to do, you will always create this scenario, yeah, and so it's right. understanding you're going to create it and what the implications of that's going to be. Because of course he's the expectation is is if he starts from scratch, there's going to be these new combinations in it. So understanding what the output of these combinations is going to be, and and 
taking time to understand the player may look pretty bad for a period of time because they're in those poor combinations. So, and look, the expectation is with the new hierarchy in place, there will be a, a level of understanding around around this. Um, but it's a, it's a case of, you know, you have to look at every every Wallabies coach since Rod McQueen, Rod McQueen, who never won a title, has won a Super Rugby title. You know, Czech won two titles. He won a European Cup. Mm. Dave Rennie won two. So, so they're not. They've never been bad. They've never been no. poor. So it's not about the coaching. It's about what they've got to work with. What they've got to and, select. Exactly. And through our lens, it's absolutely got to do with the level of cohesion that's coming up through Super Rugby. Which is interesting. Which is really interesting. You look at a team like the Waratahs, you know, the season, they've had so many cro- close losses and also a couple of close wins over the Crusaders. Um, but when you look at the points differential, they're not a bad team. Uh, mm. And it comes down to the pointy end. A couple of kicks, actually three little tiny moments, and the Waratahs are having the same story as the Brumbies. So how do you analyze that in terms of those big moments? So like we're not talking about a team that's languishing, giving up lots of points. They just don't know how to close out a match the way the Brumbies know. Um, is that something from cohesion or is that something from having superlative, you know, a couple of really good decision makers, you know, at nine and ten, um, that kind of thing? How do you how do you build that winning close matches? Uh, OK, well, I, I can't really answer the question because they won a clo- They closed out a match on the weekend. So. Yeah, true, yeah, well done. True, Very well fair, done. Yeah. But, but if if Tane Edmed had kicked that, kicked that penalty against the Highlanders and right. Camille Valentini, good Victorian boy, by the way, yes. uh, had, had missed that or not taken that drop goal, or if Tane had um, hit his drop goal instead of you know hitting Ned Hennigan on the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this whole narrative would be would be Darren Coleman, unbelievable. Very yeah. different. Yeah. So I love my case study. So um, a colleague a colleague of ours did a study in the AFL of he basically looked at an AFL team and studied results that were within a within less than six points when the team won versus results within less than six points, so less than a goal when a team lost. So effectively, it's effectively luck. Did the ball shave the goalpost? Did the ball touch someone's fingers? And you look at the coach assessment of players when they just won versus the coach assessment of players when they just lost. Literally won by luck. Lost, yeah, by lost by luck. So, uh, so those and coach that, assessments are they are they internal? You're talking about? Yeah, internal coach yep. assessments. Yep. The coach assessing of the players. Yeah. The coach when the, when the team just won, the assessment of the players were, oh my god, you played so well, fantastic. When they just lost, you were it was you got to lift your game. This is terrible. So and it was just luck. Prof- yeah. It was just even at the professional yeah, level. Right. Even at the professional level, and AFL is a pretty professional, highly science Absolutely. sport. The perception of results pushes the pushes this sort of the, stretches sort of the emotional barrier there around, and so the so what we try and do is around these conversations. What did the data tell us? That's what very interesting. Tell us around the um, results, that is, yeah, that's that's really very interesting. Result Simon. was going to be very close. So, yeah. by, and not saying this for the Waratahs. So, so when we look at a game, and this is a good thing about our markers, so we have a set of markers. So for a game of rugby union, we have about 200 individual little numbers, I say little, 200 numbers that describe <laughs> a team. Describe a team, and we have 200 plus numbers that describe the opposite team, and we have certain those that we pull out and say, well, team A versus team B, we believe this is the outcome because of these reasons. Mm-hmm. And we use that. And generally in, in most competitions, we're between... 70 to 80 percent it picks the result we use that to give context to performance and so we can say based on this we believe this is the result so if the game was expected to be quite close and say you lost by three points because you missed a kick or won by three points because the opposition missed a kick it gives context to that and so 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 even if a team might be might be um you know down by uh, lost two two games, for example. You're actually not under or overachieving. You're on the right path, though. 
That's very interesting, Simon. So in the NBA, where they have a different game and different sample size, obviously, but they took all the playoff games and they took people's uh, players' shooting percentage in those sort of three different scenarios. One, you're within two or three points. One, you're within five points. And one, you're, it's, it's a blowout. And then they compare those. So, so meaningful crunch time stat. Mm. And LeBron James in the early part of his career was, would, would shoot worse the closer the game was in a meaningful game, the worse he would shoot, whereas a Steph Curry would shoot better. And then by the end of his career now, uh, LeBron James is the clutch player. But you can quantify that in, in basketball because it's really easy to do that. You can take, yeah. you know, you got 40 shots, well, 20 shots a game, and you can put those into clusters and say, oh, these are the shots we're talking about. Is down the stretch, crunch time within five, two minutes to go, does it go up or down? Uh, rugby is such a hard game to put that into. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it is. And and I agree with that. So, like I said, our numbers, so what we do is not black and white because there are yeah. still games. Uh, fours versus reds, completely against the numbers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Against the numbers. And the real, positive, the real positive out of that, like it's a negative for us because it's, oh, wait up, this doesn't match our numbers. Is this something wrong with our numbers? Like that is an outlier for us. But right. it's good because what it shows is, like, the, the, the force players aren't nufties. Yes, they haven't yeah. won many games. It's not that they're bad players. It's just that they're, they're just building and they just have to yeah. get there. So given the right scenario, they can show that they're good players in that time. Um, there was a game a few seasons ago, the Highlanders beat the Crusaders, very similar scenario, completely against the numbers. But so it means there are other things that at play, and that's where that, you know, t other twenty and thirty percent of the games that we get wrong, it's it's in there, but it just shows how much cohesion, as we measure it, influences performance because the numbers really tell a story. So the last couple of World Cups, ninety three percent of World Cup games went by the cohesion numbers, and so um, so it, it has a big influence on on the result, regardless of who the players are, who the coach is, what the playing style is. Yeah, is right. That's oh, this is so interesting. This is so interesting. We, and I don't want to take the romance out of it. What we try and do is give context to that performance, so organisations yeah. can make better decisions, and they don't make reactive decisions yeah. around performance. This is we we enjoyed the conversation with Ben last year for exactly the same reasons that we've loved this conversation here, Simon. It's just it is just a completely different perspective on confirming or denying things that, that, that you know but for completely different reasons that the average person doesn't think of it's it's just we could easily keep firing questions at you here for <laughs> several more hours and we won't do that because you know again as i said to laurie fisher last week we've got to edit this so <laughs> but look thank, thank you so much for giving us some time and and, and getting into this I, I don't know how deep we've delved into it but it feels like we've got in a, a good distance and i've got no doubt all people are going to pick something up out of this so so thanks so much for this. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that's it absolutely my pleasure so appreciate it appreciate it simon i think it also builds some empathy for boards you know fans are love to just criticize the, the administrators of, of this sport but it's actually difficult when you find yourself in a trough through injury or transition and then yeah. how do you do it uh, it's not that simple yeah yeah no that's, thanks. E that's exactly right yeah thanks so much mate really enjoyed this no, my pleasure, my pleasure, absolutely. Cheers. This is the 8-9 Combo Rugby Podcast with Brett McKay and Harry Jones, and, mate, that was such an enjoyable chat with Simon Strawn. Like, I'm, ex I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Yeah. It was a substantive uh, – it was like we were back in, in university or something. It was good. It was. Yeah, I feel like – I feel like we've got homework to do. We should get we should get credit for that. <laughs> we should do, yeah, we should do. No, it's such a such a great chat. I really hope everyone um, everyone's really got something out of that because there's so much to learn and there's so much we still don't know. So um, it is. Just, Those guys do is, good work, Ben Ben Darwin do, and Simon. They just they do really, really well. uh, love love games. They love they love the the science of it in a way that I think is really enjoyable. Absolutely, and so you'll find you'll find Simon Strawn on on Twitter. You'll find Ben Darwin on Twitter as well. But you can follow Gainline at GL Analytics as well. So um, yeah, absolutely worth following if you if you love your rugby and you love the way teams build squads. It's it's really really interesting.
Um, something we are doing a little bit different this year is to dedicate this little segment each week to the various competitions around the world, touching on the major talking points as we go through them. And we'll stick with Super Rugby Pacific, mate. We've been talking about them for about that competition for a little while now. Uh, last weekend, of course, Moana Pacifica recorded their third win in the season for the first time in their existence, beating Queensland 17 14 up in Whangarei. Um, Tate McDermott. Fraser McWright caught red cards. We can't say too much about the judicial hearings because they took place as we recorded this and the findings and suspensions or not may or may not have been handed down as you've listened to this. So just assume that we wanted to talk about it and timings worked against us uh, in this particular case, as, as happens sometimes. Will Harrison kicked the Waratahs to a golden point win over the Crusaders as, as we touched on through this conversation. And I wonder, mate, whether he... How long before does he start conversation start? I wonder if they've started already. Yeah, I don't know. I think Tane Edmund actually ran a really good attack that get that match. He also plays really well around the rock and breakdown. So if there's a way to put both those guys in so you have a solid goal kicker, oh, Tane's not a bad goal kicker either. I, I just no. think that, that Will Harrison's superlative. I mean, like you look at his stats over the long haul, he's really a good marksman. When... When Edmund first came in, he was playing twelve outside Harrison yeah, and, and, I could and see that. at ten, yeah. so it could work. And I Harrison's could see I could see uh, Carter Gordon and Tane Edmund playing twelve sometimes. Yeah, they they, yeah. they have that they're hard they're hard boys. The, car, the Carter Gordon at twelve uh, idea is something that we spoke of very early on in the pod this year, and it just I I like the idea more and more. Uh, the Hurricanes remain un, uh, unbeaten with a, a fairly convincing win over the Chiefs, um, and the Rebels beat the Highlanders as I mentioned right at the very top. So uh, the eight the, the eight nine combination fight between Canes and Chiefs was something to behold. It yeah, was Luke Jacobson very good. concrete shouldered Luke Jacobson and Ratama uh, against I will say and uh, TJ Perinara having his renaissance. Yeah. It was really good match to watch. That was that was yeah. my match of the round. No matter how close the score wasn't. It was just that first, I don't know, 60 minutes was ridiculous. It was, it was a great contest, and it really only blew out in the last 15, you're right. So yeah. that's games of the week absolutely delivering. And we'll be back uh, later in the week to discuss round nine of Super Rugby uh, with games of the week. So so do make sure you're, you're ready and, and uh, followed for that. Uh, Champions Cup quarterfinals, Ooh. all four winners post 40-plus points. And I think that's, that's the first time that's ever happened in European competition. So I think Russ Petty, uh, who's a you know big stat guy on, on Twitter, he, he put out that it was the highest uh, average score for a round ever in the Champions League, you know, where – aggregate like where both teams yeah, are scoring for a quarter final yeah 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 cuz like the Quins and Bordeaux I mean they were just going back and I forth did. it was whoever had the ball at the end was going to win I I heard he, I did actually see a stat of his and it said something along the lines of in the history of the Champions Cup and I don't know whether he means the old Heineken Cup in this as well but he said there was there'd been five instances of 80 points scored 80 points plus been scored in a quarter final three of them happened this weekend so it was, it's it's just it's just crazy. So Harlequins beat Bordeaux in France. Uh, Bordeaux missed the conversion in the seventy sixth minute. Luke Leinster, Leinster thump La Rochelle, and so all the uh, the the Ronan O'Gara monster mind games were for were for North uh, Northampton. Did you see? Beat- did you see how badly they booed Ronan O'Gara? I mean, it I was did. unbelievable. It was. Wow. Uh, it was tribal booing is what it was. They I would say uh, Leinster's Kiwis outplayed La Rochelle's Kiwis, and that was the difference. Yeah. I mean, James yeah. Lowe and Jameson Gibson Park are playing out of their skulls. Yeah, no, fair, all fair. Northampton beat the business class Bulls comfortably, 59-22 at uh, Franklin Gardens. Um, they got John pumped. Rahm, ex-Waratah's <laughs> winger, scored. They did get pumped. Uh, bagged a double for the Saints, and Toulouse did it easy as well. They were too good for Exeter, 64-26. The semifinals will be the weekend of May, 4-5-6, and we will absolutely talk about that at the time. The URC, the Premiership, the top 14 are all back this weekend. In Japan, um, again, games of the week for the win. A missed conversion in the 86th minute from Bryn Gatlin left Cabelco, Kobe Steelers, Playoff hopes absolutely dangling by a thread. Um, oh, that's they, painful. 86th minute. 86th minute version. <laughs> so they drew with Toshiba Brave Lupu's 40 all. And so now Toshiba are locked into the semis. They, they're second currently. Um, but 
Kobe, the Kobe, uh, the Steelers, Dave Rennie's team, they're seven points outside the top four now with seven with three games to go. So they've even lost hold of their own destiny now. They're they're in a real state. So uh, elsewhere in Japan, the top teams beat the bottom teams, and Panasonic are like nine points clear or something like that now. But um, yeah, that again, games of the week just for the win in Major League Rugby. Um, it was an 80th minute try to prop Tommy Beckerman to deliver the win for the Dallas Jackals over the Utah Warriors. But you know all this. A 13-man mall. That's what I like. 13-man mall. Well, that was the last try. Yes. You've got, to, you've got to send me a clip of this and we've got to there get was a was a, a fullback and a nine were the only ones not in the mall. <laughs> I, I, want you to, I want you to pop something up on the, on the eight, nine, on all the eight, nine socials of that 13 met mall and i want you i want numbers above them arriving so you know seven, eight, <laughs> nine, I, want, I want the number to say right so, got it i uh, got that you'll, you'll get that coming so that was 22 20 over the utah warriors and the unbeaten start of the goddamn houston Sabercats has come to an end at the hands of the new england free jacks they were beaten 47 35 at home so new england Man, now free jacks came to play was under oh, uh was it a gale storm like almost a unbelievable wind was coming from whipping off yeah. the gulf of mexico under paprika sunset skies it looked like the free jacks were there to play and the saber cats never caught up and and now new england lead the Eastern Conference by six points. Uh, Seattle lead the Western Conference by five. Um, and as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, don't miss our new end of week show, Games of the Week, where we go through all the weekend's games in all the comps around the world. We pull out, you know, which matches we think you should watch each weekend. And it's just another reason for you to like, follow, and subscribe and make sure you catch it as soon as it drops. Break. Some news of the last seven days, mate, to quickly wrap up episode 10. Uh, the Queensland Reds are going to go to Bristol next year and play the Bears over there on January 31. That's a part of a two-match European preseason tour. Um, the second match is yet to be announced, but it'll be the first time Queensland have been to Europe since 1990 uh, and their first game against Bristol since 1980. So a bit of a old school tour for England, uh, for, for England, for, uh, for Queensland. Um, there's reports that former All Blacks coach Ian Foster has signed a deal to join Toyota for Blitz in Japan, where he would reunite with Sir Stephen Hansen, who is the director of rugby. There. So, you know, Smith, Barrett, Foster, Hansen just makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, Crusaders player Sever Reese equaled the record of Caleb Ralph as their leading try scorer on the weekend, scored cross for number 51 and 52 to equal the record against New South Wales. I suspect he'll hold that on his own uh, by the end of this weekend. They head to Perth to take on the Western Force. Um, reports that Mick Byrne is in line to coach the Fijian national team. Reports that mm. Joe Schmidt might have had a major win with Rugby Australia and that he'll be able to select as many overseas players as he wants, which is counter to what he said about preferring players being in Australia. So we'll see how that actually plays out. And reports as well that uh, Guy Porter uh, has, is will leave Leicester... Well, sorry. Guy Porter and Nick Dolly will both leave Leicester Tigers to come home to Australia. Nick Dolly is suppose reportedly on his way to the force and the the very strong suspicion is that guy porter is heading to the force as well where he'll likely replace um sam spink who's going back to england with saracens i think so mm. force uh you know force 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 recruitment going going all right there so yeah that's good <laughs> yeah, right. now is not the time for me to talk <laughs> on the phone that's a cute uh, ring it link, is, link. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Um, but that noise is the full time buzzer on episode 10 of the 8 9 combo. Perfect timing. Mate. Perfect timing. Thanks to everyone out there in the rugby world who has found us. You can check the show notes <laughs> for the links to the 8 9 combo on Twitter, Insta, YouTube, uh, where you'll find video versions of the pod each week. Uh, also on TikTok as well. So do give us a like, follow, subscribe. Uh, interact with the pod directly, but also rate us and share and all that sort of stuff. And we are starting from scratch. So if you've rated us before, then we please would love it very much if you could rate us again. Um, Chart-wise, Laurie Fisher pushed us back into the top 10 in the US, Canada, Australia. Uh, I think we got to number four in South Africa. So, Good Lord. Lord. Good Lord, indeed. So Harry and I are on the socials in our 
usual places at Harry Baldy Jones and at BMC Sport. Uh, you find Harry on the Raw a couple of times a month. You find my weekly Australian columns on Rugby Pass as well. So that is us done. Thanks so much for joining us. This is the 8-9 combo, the short side set piece combination you didn't realise you needed coming from the podcast double act you already had. Uh, I'm Brett McKay. He's Harry Jones. And we'll be back in your ears in a few days' time, in fact, with Games of the Week. Come play with us. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like an 